Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 20th September 2019. These are the list of articles chosen for today's analysis. It has been given along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi, Tirunandapuram and Hyderabad editions. The link for the handwritten notes and the timestamping for the displayed articles is provided in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to the first article analysis for the day. This news article is about the recent judgment by Kerala High Court on the right to have access to the internet. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. In the recent judgment, the Kerala High Court has said that the right to have access to internet is a part of fundamental right to education as well as it is a part of fundamental right to privacy under Article 21 of the Constitution. So let us see in brief about the case which led to this judgment. A writ petition was filed by a female student of Kerala. The college in which the student was studying had a rule that the inmates of the hostel were not allowed to use their mobile phones from 10 pm to 6 am within the hostel. And the undergraduate students were also not allowed to use laptops in the hostel. This time restriction was changed by the college management. It was changed from 6 pm to 6 am. So, due to this issue, the student along with some other inmates of the hostel had protested against this restriction. They were saying that they were not able to learn due to restrictions. As a result, the college expelled her from the hostel on the grounds that she did not abide by the rules of the college management. So, the female student has filed a writ petition in the High Court of Kerala to resolve this issue. The student has claimed that internet which is accessible through mobile phones or laptops provides an avenue or opportunity for students to gather knowledge but the rules imposed by the college management restricted such opportunity. So she has claimed in the High Court of Kerala that restrictions on the use of mobile phones amounted to a violation of fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression which is guaranteed under Article 19, Clause 1, Sub Clause A of Constitution. She also claimed that restriction imposed by the college management is a violation of right to privacy under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution and it is also a violation to right to education under Article 21A of the Constitution. So now based on this writ petition, the judgment has been passed by the Kerala High Court. The High Court has held that right to have access to internet is a part of fundamental right to education and it is a part of fundamental right to privacy under article 21 of the constitution. So first let us see the basis on which the judge has held that the action of college authorities violate the right to education. The basis was a resolution which was adopted by Human Rights Council of United Nations. It was resolution 23 bar 2 which was adopted in the 23rd session of Human Rights Council. This session was held in 2013. This resolution is about the role of freedom of opinion and expression in women's empowerment. Now two things are to be noted from this resolution. First is that this resolution calls upon the states to promote respect and ensure women's exercise of freedom of opinion and expression both online and offline. Next is that this resolution also calls to facilitate equal participation in access to information and communications technology and use of information and communications technology such as internet. And this has to be done by applying a gender perspective and the resolution also calls to encourage international cooperation that are aimed at the development of media and information and communication facilities in all the countries. From both these resolutions, the High Court has noted that Human Rights Council of the United Nations has found the right of access to internet as a fundamental freedom and the right of access to internet is a tool to ensure right to education. So any rule or instruction which impairs or affects these rights of the students cannot be permitted. Now next let us see the basis on which uh, the court has told that the action of college authorities violate the right to privacy. For this the court has quoted one judgment to convey how the right to have access to internet becomes the part of right to privacy under article 21 of the constitution. This judgment is a famous judgment given by the supreme court in the 
Puttaswamy case. In this case, the Supreme Court held that right to privacy is held to be an intrinsic part of right to life, personal liberty and dignity. And hence, right to privacy is a fundamental right under part 3 of the constitution. So, having access to internet becomes the part of right to privacy. And right to privacy is an intrinsic part of right to life, personal liberty and dignity. So, this means having access to internet is a right under right to life, personal liberty and dignity. The High Court also quoted one another judgment to show how right to have access to internet becomes a part of right to education as well as right to privacy. For this, they have quoted the 1997 judgment of Supreme Court which was the judgment on the case Vishaka and others versus state of Rajasthan and others. In this judgment, the Supreme Court gave a set of guidelines. These guidelines are against sexual harassment at workplace. They are famously known as Vishaka guidelines. In this judgment, the Supreme Court noted that the international conventions and norms are to be read with the fundamental rights which are guaranteed in the constitution of India. It has to be done when there is an absence of any enacted domestic law on the particular issue. So, based on this judgment, the Kerala High Court has held that the right to have access to internet becomes the part of right to education as well as right to privacy under article 21 of the constitution because it is provided by the International Resolution of Human Rights Council. So, all these three judgments are the basis why the High Court judges have noted that the action of college authorities infringed the right to education and right to privacy of the students. So, from this article, remember that right to have access to internet is a part of fundamental right to education and it is also a part of fundamental right to privacy under Article 21 of the Constitution. With this, we have come to the end of this news article discussion. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article discussion, which is based on this editorial, Can Hindi Unite India? The discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. This editorial article is based on the recent statement made by Home Minister on the Hindi Day celebrations. Home Minister said that it is important to have a language for the whole country which can become the identity of the country globally. He also added that Hindi can do the work of uniting the country. Now, this statement has resulted in criticism from political leaders in South India. So, after this criticism, the Home Minister has clarified that Hindi should be learnt as a second language after one's mother tongue. So, in this context, it is important to understand Article 351 of the Constitution. The Article 351 directs the Union to promote the spread of Hindi language so that it may serve as a medium of expression for all the elements of the composite culture of India. So, from this, we can know that the Constitution directs the central government to promote Hindi and not to impose Hindi on all the states. So, based on this background, let us discuss the article. We know that India is a land of many languages. According to the 2011 census of India, there were 1,369 mother tongues in the country and Hindi is just one of them. According to the census data, Hindi is spoken by a large number of people in India because it is spoken by more than 52 crores of people which amounts to 43.63 percentage of the population. But here you have to note one point. Bhojpuri, Rajasthani, Haryanvi etc. are also put as subset of Hindi. So, in this census, the people who speak Bhojpuri, Rajasthani, Haryanvi are also counted under the subset of Hindi only. That is why it is amounting to 52 crores of people. But still if you see that it just amounts to 43.63 percent of the population. So, this means Hindi is not spoken by the majority of Indians. That is around 56 percentage of the people speak other languages. So, based on this data, the authors are saying that the argument of the Home Minister that Hindi can unite the country is not reasonable. According to the authors, Indian constitution is the one which unites the country because the schedule 8 of the Indian constitution lists 22 languages as official languages. So, constitution upholds the language diversity of India. 
Hence, the authors are questioning how can we say that one particular language out of 22 languages can unite the country. And the authors also say that what connects India is our constitution, our history and events like Bhakti movement or freedom struggle. In this, Bhakti movement is an important landmark in the cultural history of medieval India. It was a silent revolution in the society which was brought by many socio-religious reformers. This movement was responsible for many rites and rituals associated with the worship of God by Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs of Indian subcontinent. For example, Kirtan at a Hindu temple or Kavali at a Darga and singing of Gurbani at a Gurdwara are all derived from the Bhakti movement of medieval India. So, the Bhakti movement and the freedom struggles brought the people together. So, according to the authors, the statement of the Home Minister is neither historically sensible nor constitutionally right. Next, the authors talk about the issues that are associated with the expansion of Hindi. The authors believe that when the language tries to expand beyond its carrying capacity, beyond its uh, scope, then it starts to break. For this, the authors give the example of Latin, Sanskrit, etc. Latin dominated the Western Europe during the medieval period and Sanskrit was a dominant language in ancient India. Now both are obsolete and the authors believe that the same is also happening to English as well. So according to them, trying to expand Hindi throughout India may not be a linguistically tenable, which means it may not be able to be maintained for a longer period of time. Next, the author discusses about the problem with one nation, one language formula. According to the authors, the idea of one nation, one language, one culture emerged in Europe in the 19th century. But this idea failed to create unity. So, according to the authors, promoting one language to unite India is an attempt to copy the failed idea because India is known for its multilingualism. That is, India has diversity of languages. The author gives the reason behind this one nation, one language formula. According to the authors, it is the colonial mindset of Indians because we were colonialized by the British who could not think beyond one language. That is, they could not think beyond the language of English. So, in the same way, we are thinking similarly for Hindi also. As we saw earlier, even the authors believe that the idea of one language is not in line with our history culture and civilization. According to them, during national movement, many leaders visualized a special role for Hindi. But the authors are arguing that most of them supported Hindustani, which is a mixture of languages and not the pure Hindi, which is promoted today. And even the leaders of the national movement were clear that Hindi cannot be imposed on all. Next, the authors discuss about the need to promote a common language for communication, education and governance in the larger cities because there is a large scale interstate migration in India. According to the authors, in the current scenario, nearly 35% of the people in India are migrating daily for work. So, it is important to create a new form of language identity to our states. It is because the large cities or the metropolises in uh, India such as Delhi, Mumbai, etc. have residents from different states. So, the authors uh, are saying that they should be recognized as multilingual entities. So, it will help the linguistic diversity in such a large city in many ways. For this, the authors also suggest uh, one policy that is framing an educational policy with uh, options to choose language apart from the state's official language. The authors gives an example for this. In Maharashtra, one may argue that children must be instructed only in Marathi. It is a good argument for the linguistic state for the promotion of its official language. But it may not be a good idea to impose it in Mumbai because Mumbai is a large city with people from many other states in India. So, they must be provided with an option such as uh, Hindi, English or any other uh, Indian language rather than imposing Marathi on them. So, according to the authors, states should widen the language choice of citizens rather than narrowing it down. The authors believes that promoting ideas such as united by one language in a diverse country like India will only generate hostility between linguistic groups. Hostility means 
unfriendly behavior or a fighting behavior so if this idea is promoted indians will never have a happy relation with the neighbors or with the neighboring states apart from this the idea of promoting any one language can also be economically disastrous for india because this will slow down migration in india hence the amount of economic activity and economic output will also come down so the authors are saying that india is a country which boasts about its unity and diversity so it should give enough space to accommodate the diversity and diversity should not be seen as a cultural burden after this the authors also discuss about the three language policy so let us first understand in brief about the three language formula the three language formula was devised in the chief ministers conferences which was held during 1961 the national commission on education which is known as the kothari commission examined and recommended a graduated formula which was recommended by the 1968 national policy on education the policy meant that for a child the initial language of instruction should be the language spoken by her mother or the language spoken in the home and gradually the child should be shifted to the state's official language english should be taught as a language but it should not burden everyone the policy also noted that hindi should be introduced in non hindi speaking states from an early stage similarly hindi speaking states should introduce a non hindi indian language the authors believe that a child in her initial stages of education should not be burdened with many languages the child should learn new languages in her middle school this would widen her horizon and perspectives beyond her own linguistic zone so learning one of the world languages like english would open up more opportunities to the child so the three language formula was a sound formula for the overall development of children and the integration of the country but according to the authors there were several flaws in the implementation of this policy it is because the non hindi speaking states introduced hindi in their curriculum but the hindi speaking states bypassed the non hindi language especially they bypass the south indian languages with sanskrit that is why the three language formula which was intended for national integration began to look like a move to impose hindi on southern states this could have been avoided if the hindi speaking states would have introduced non hindi indian languages the other issue was that indian elites shifted to english only education and they do not have enough knowledge of indian language and the authors believe that imposition of english has been taking place in india and even most of us do not even realize it that is why even in rural areas children are forced to go to an english medium school so according to the authors going for a majoritarian language would only result in linguistic disaster this has happened with the tribal languages because the tribal languages are rapidly disappearing and they are getting assimilated to some other larger languages that is they are being subsumed by other larger languages this is because there are not enough livelihood opportunities in those tribal languages so the authors is of the view that hindi and english speakers are comparatively better privileged than those speaking the tribal languages for example those who are uh, fluent in hindi and english can attempt competitive exams and they will have more job opportunities and they can understand the curriculum etc but the people speaking tribal languages do not have these privileges so finally the authors are saying that out of world's 6000 languages india has a close to 10% of the spoken languages so this unique gift will be lost if india chooses to become a nation of one or two languages only apart from this freedom to use one's own language is a emotive issue that is it is related with strong feelings so if this diversity or freedom is not maintained it may divide our country on linguistic basis the authors are saying this based on an example they give the example of separation of west pakistan and east pakistan in the year 1971 the major reason for separation was that west pakistan spoke urdu and east pakistan spoke bengali so these two parts of pakistan were divided on linguistic basis so this led to the formation of bangladesh as a separate nation because the urdu speaking pakistan was subjugating 
the bengali speaking east pakistan so the authors are saying that if ideas like uh, promoting one language is carried out in india then we will also have the fate like pakistan only so the authors are concluding that india has survived as a nation with unity in diversity for the last 70 years so the government should work for the promotion and protection of linguistic diversity in india rather than promoting only one language with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the split practice question will be discussed in the last session This article discussion is about the global emerging threats to children. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. The executive director of UNICEF, that is United Nations Children's Fund, has written an open letter. This open letter was issued on the occasion of 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that is the CRC Convention. We know that the children of today are facing new sets of challenges and global shifts. So the executive director has listed eight challenges in the open letter. First challenge is the lack of clean water, clean air and safe climate are the basic needs to survive. All human beings including children need these basics to sustain healthy lives. We all need a clean environment to live in, clean air to breathe. clean water to drink and clean food to eat but climate change has the potential to compromise all of these basic rights so according to the executive director climate change is the greatest threat to the rights of the next generation of children the next generation of children will bear the greatest burden of hunger and malnutrition she is saying this based on a report by the food and agriculture organization the report is titled as the state of food security and nutrition in the world 2018 this report noted that climate change is becoming a key force behind the recent continued rise in global hunger the report also noted that extreme weather events land degradation and desertification water scarcity and rising sea levels etc which shows the devastating effects of climate change are weakening the global efforts to eradicate hunger It is because the number of extreme climate related disasters including extreme heat, extreme drought, extreme floods and storms has doubled since the early 1990s. These disasters harm agricultural productivity of major crops such as wheat, rice and maize. Then this leads to rise in food price and income losses which reduces people's access to food. Now these challenges will intensify the impact of air pollution toxic waste and groundwater pollution and they will damage children's health according to unicef in the year 2017 approximately 300 million children were living in areas with the most toxic levels of outdoor air pollution the toxic levels in this outdoor air was six times or more than six times higher than the international guidelines and it contributes to the deaths of around 6 lakh children who are under the age of 5 UNICEF also says that by the year 2040 one in four children will live in areas of extreme water stress and thousands of children will be sick due to polluted water so the management and protection of clean plentiful or abundant and accessible groundwater supplies and also the management of plastic waste is important if we want to reduce the devastating impacts to the children's health The second challenge is that one in four children are likely to live and learn in conflict zones and disaster zones. Now this is a worrisome fact because children have always been the first victims of war. According to UNICEF, the number of countries which are experiencing conflict currently is the highest it has ever been since the adoption of the Child Rights Convention in the year 1989. So this means the conflict in today's world is highest since the year 1989 unicef also notes that one in four children in today's world live in countries affected by violent fights or disaster around 28 million children are driven away from their homes by wars and lack of security because of this many children lose several years of school so they also lose the records of achievements and qualifications for future learning and careers unicef also notes that 75 million children and young people have already disrupted learning 
that is their education is interrupted. Now this is happening because of conflicts and natural disasters and many of the affected children and young people have migrated across borders or they have been displaced because of these. So, this scenario is a personal tragedy for every single child. So, the executive director is worried that these scenarios will create a lost generation, disillusioned generation and angry generation of uneducated children. So, if this problem is not solved, then it will cost us our future generation. Then the third challenge is talking about mental health. The executive director stresses that we must make it okay to talk about mental health. According to her, teenagers in the present day, they smoke less, drink less, get into less trouble and generally they take fewer risks than previous generations. She even calls them as generation sensible. But still there is one area of risk for adolescents. It is the mental health disorders. According to WHO, mental health disorders or mental disorders include depression, bipolar affective disorders, schizophrenia and other uh, psychotic related disorders like uh, dementia, intellectual disabilities and developmental disorders which also includes autism. It is also said that mental health disorders among individuals who are under 18 years of age have been rising steadily over the past 30 years. And among the mental health disorders, depression is now among the leading causes of disability in the young people. World Health Organization even estimates that 62,000 adolescents died in the year 2016 because of self-harm. And this self-harm is now the third leading cause of death for adolescents who are aged between 15 to 19 years. Now many think that depression and self-harming is a rich country problem but it is not so. According to WHO estimates more than 90% of adolescent suicides in the year 2016 were in low income countries or middle income countries. This is because young people with severe mental disorders in the lower income countries often miss treatment and support that they require. The executive director even says that there is no country in the world that can claim to have conquered this challenge. That is the challenge of solving mental health disorders. World Health Organization's mental health expert even noted that when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries. So from this we can know that how countries are not focusing on the mental health disorders. Most of the low income and middle income countries are spending even less than 1% of their total health budget on mental health and the high income countries are spending 4 to 5 percent. So it is clear that the area of mental health disorders and solving them requires greater priority around the world. Now after this the fourth challenge which the executive director notes is that over 30 million of children have migrated from their place of birth. Now you may think what is the problem in this? Many of us think that migration is is a move towards better life but for too many children migration is not a positive choice but it is an urgent necessity because they do not have any opportunity to build a safe, healthy and prosperous life in the place where they were born. And when the migration is caused by any distress in their lives, then it leads to a condition where children migrate without the legal permissions which they need to migrate. So they become the irregular migrants. According to International Organization for Migration, irregular migration is the movement of persons that takes place outside the laws, regulations or international agreements. These laws, regulations or international agreements govern the entry into or exit from a state of origin. So when they do not get the legal permissions, the children also become irregular migrants. So to migrate, they often take journeys across deserts, oceans and armed borders. So in turn, they encounter violence, abuse and exploitation on their way. But if you see one of the greatest migrations which the world has ever seen is happening not across the borders but it is happening within borders because millions are migrating internally from rural areas to urban areas. We think that urban residents on an average enjoy better access to services and opportunities. 
but actually if you see the inequalities can be so large that many of the most disadvantaged children in urban areas are subjected to worse scenarios than the children who are in rural areas for example estimates uh, state that one in four countries the poorest urban children are more likely to die before their fifth birthday that is before they attain the age of 5 than the poorest children in the rural areas and even the poorest urban children are less likely to complete primary school than rural children and this is happening in one in six countries so from this we can know that how migration is affecting the lives of children now the next challenge is that thousands of children will officially never exist unless we act immediately now this seems to be a severe problem because every child has a right to a legal identity they have the legal right to have birth registration and they have the legal right to have a nationality but studies show that 1/4 of children who are born today that is which amounts to almost 1 lakh babies may never have an official birth certificate or they may not even qualify for a passport according to unicef if the parents of the child are stateless or if they are from a persecuted or oppressed community or if they are from a marginalized community or if they even live in a poor remote region their children may never be given a identity or a birth certificate they may be denied citizenship or their citizenship could be taken away by the government like it is happening in our country due to nrc that is due to national register of citizens process so this means there is a lack of formal recognition by the country or by the government so this means that particular child or the person will be denied health care education and other government services in addition to this if they have a lack of official identification if the child even enters into a marriage the authorities will never know that it is a child marriage because of lack of official identification and the child may even get into a dangerous work which may not be allowed for their age like this if they do not have a official identification they may fall prey to the societal injustice so this means if the child is an unregistered child or a stateless child that child will be invisible to the authorities which eventually means that the child never existed so according to the executive director of unicef this is a much bigger problem now the next challenge is that 21st century skills are required for a 21st century economy now this is so obvious but what is the problem here is that many do not have the facility to access education and to get the skills that is required for the 21st century economy according to unicef more than 1.8 billion young people are between the ages of 10 and 24 in the world and this is one of the largest units in the human history this means these many young people have never been existed in the same period and many of them lack access to education which will prepare them for a job and opportunity so they do not have the skill and outlook that they need for a 21st century economy so this means they cannot get a high end job this means they may not be chosen for a highest position in any organization so they may have to take the meager jobs which is available in the society so if even half of these young people that is half of 1.8 billion people are into daily wages so this means if they lack opportunity they will be having a lack of job offers also so this means they will be pushed into a poverty trap so you can see how education and skills play an important role in leading a healthy normal life now the next challenge is that the digital footprint generated by the children has to be protected we know that this is a digital generation and more than 1 in 3 children globally are thought to be regular users of internet so you may think what is wrong in having access to internet the problem is that if the children have the access to daily online services and they can browse social media using search engines e-commerce and government platforms and they can play games in online and if they can download apps and if they can use their mobile geolocation services all these thing will uh, leave a digital footprint which is composed of thousands of pieces of data 
so without their knowledge thousands of pieces of data is accumulating around the children the executive director even says that these data may even have been gathered before birth of that child or even certainly before the children are able to knowingly consent to this data collection so this means children without knowing are giving their personal information to unknown people through online media and these personal information which are created during childhood may be shared with third parties and they may be traded for profit or even they may be used to exploit young people particularly those who are from the vulnerable and marginalized sections and also we already have a problem with hackers so they may be able to exploit the vulnerabilities in the e-commerce platforms so they can defraud and exploit children like they do with adults and we know that search engines track users behavior so this means if a child is using it the child's behavior will also be tracked so many studies worry that the data which is collected during childhood have a potential to influence future opportunities of that child such as how they get access to finance education insurance and healthcare may depend on this data which is collected during their childhood so like so as adults children also have privacy and the internet has never been designed with children's rights and children's needs in mind so we have to be very careful regarding the personal information about the children on internet and the final challenge is that they might be the least trusting generation of citizens ever the executive director is saying so because every child has the right to actively participate in their societies and many of them have their first experience with societies online so the executive director is fearing that majority of the children will grow up in a digital environment that is filled with misinformation and fake news and these misinformation and fake news undermines the trust and engagement with institutions and information sources some studies even indicate that many children and young people today have a difficulty in distinguishing a fact from fiction which is available online so this means as a consequence of this young generation is finding it more difficult to know who to trust and what to trust and every day the technology is improving so that means the technology to deceive also improves so verifying any content becomes more difficult as a result of this they will grow a potential for lowered trust in institutions and social discord or social disagreement will grow more like i might be seeing one source of information in the internet and my friend might be seeing another information regarding the same area in another platform in the internet and we both think both are facts but it may be not so because both may be fiction that is both may be just imagination of some person it may not be true at all so eventually we will not be able to trust any information which is available around us so if the technologies like these advance and we do not take any step to reduce fake news and misinformation which is available online then our next generation will never know what is fake and what is real and they may lose confidence in science and medicine and it may lead to the destroy of core institutions and beliefs and it will lead to the division of communities and it will pose a grave threat to our democracies so these are the challenges for the future generation which is listed by the executive director of unicef with this we have come to the end of this article discussion moving on to the next article discussion which is about the archaeological findings of kiradi which is located in the present day tamil nadu state the syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference yesterday that is on 19th september a report has been published by the archaeology department of tamil nadu state the report is titled as kiradi an urban settlement of sangam age on the banks of river vaigai now in this kiradi is located southeast to the present day madurai city of tamil nadu it is located on the banks of river vaigai archaeological excavations have been going on in kiradi since 2015 as of now four phases of excavations have been completed and the fifth phase of excavation have begun in the month of june 2019 in this the first three phases were conducted by the archaeological survey of india but the fourth phase was conducted by the department of archaeology government of tamil nadu 
and the fifth phase is also being conducted by Department of Archaeology, Government of Tamil Nadu. In this, the first phase was carried out from March to September 2015. Second phase was from January to September 2016. And third phase was from May 2017 to September 2017. And from the first three phases, more than around 8,000 artifacts have been unearthed or have been discovered. These artifacts includes pottery with Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. Then it also includes gold coins, beads, iron tools and jewellery. Along with these artifacts, a charcoal was also found in the site. So, a carbon dating of the charcoal was conducted. Here, carbon dating means radiocarbon dating. It is a method of determining the age of any objects that contains carbon. Through the carbon dating, it was found that the settlement which was being excavated in the Kiridi site belonged to 200 BC, that is before 2200 years roughly. So, the archaeologists tell that urban civilization existed in Tamil Nadu. Then the fourth phase of excavations began in April 2018 and it went on till October 2018. Around 7,000 artifacts were collected in the fourth phase. We saw in the beginning that this excavation was conducted by the Tamil Nadu Archaeology Department. Now, the report of this fourth excavation has been released by the department yesterday. So, now let us see some of the facts that is mentioned in the report which is given in the news article. Based on the excavations, the Tamil Nadu Archaeology Department has said that the excavated artifacts could be dated to a period between 6th century BCE to 1st century CE. In this BCE means before common era and CE means common era. Previously, it was believed that the artifacts belonged to the period of 300 BCE, but now the timeline has been pushed roughly 300 years back. That is, it has been pushed to 6th century BCE. When we say 6th century BCE, it means the years from 600 BCE to 501 BCE, that is 100 years. So, now how the archaeologists came to this conclusion? This conclusion is based on the radiocarbon dating results of one of the artifacts. Six carbon samples were collected from the fourth excavations at Keeladi. It was sent to a lab in USA. In that lab, accelerator mass spectrometry dating was performed. This dating method is also one of the type of radiocarbon dating. Based on the test results, the scientists were able to confirm that the artifact belonged to 580 BCE, that is, it is from the 6th century BCE. So, the results from the fourth excavations have suggested that the second urbanization happened in Vaigai plains of Tamil Nadu around 6th century BCE, as it happened in the Gangetic plains. The first urbanization is the Indus Valley Civilization, which is roughly 5000 years ago, that is in the 3rd millennium BC. Next finding is that around 56 potsherds inscribed with Tamil Brahmi script were recovered from this site. It was recovered in the fourth phase of the excavations alone. Here, potsherds means a broken piece of ceramic material, which is found in the archaeological site. If you see, before it was thought that Tamil Brahmi script evolved around 5th century BCE. But based on the scientific data which we just saw, the date of Tamil Brahmi script has also been pushed back to one more century. That is, it has been pushed to 6th century BCE. So, we can tell that the people who lived in this area attained literacy or they learned the art of writing as early as 6th century BCE. Next, the report has also said that no object of worship was found at the excavation site. This shows that the society was a secular society at that period of time. Next, some skeletal fragments, that is some skeletal pieces were also found at the site. These samples were sent to the Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, which is in Pune, for analysis. These skeletal pieces were found to be of animals and birds. The animals which were identified were cow, buffalo, sheep, goat, nilgai, black buck, wild boar and the bird peacock. Next, the report has also told that a well-established weaving industry thrived in the excavated site. So, how did the archaeologists came to this conclusion? 
In the site, they have found many materials associated with the traditional weaving, such as spindle whorls, sharply pinpointed bone tip tools, which is used for design creations. Then they have also found hanging stones of yarn and then some terracotta spheres also. Along with these, a copper needle was also excavated. Apart from this, earthen vessels to hold liquid were also found in this site. All these materials are used in different processes of weaving industry. So, the report is of the view that a well-established weaving industry existed at this site. Also, some of the pottery specimens which were excavated in the Kiradi site were sent to the Earth Science Department of Pisa University in Italy. It was sent for the mineral analysis. They analyzed the mineral content of the pottery and the mineral content of the soil sample from the excavation site. The scientists were able to confirm that the water containers and cooking vessels which were found in the site were shaped out of locally available raw materials. So, these are uh, some of the findings of the excavations which is mentioned in the news article. So, we can now uh, see that there has been an urban settlement which flourished at Kiradi since 6th century BC. So, more excavations from this site will give us interesting findings about the society of Sangam age. And the Sangam age is approximately from 300 BCE to 3 AD. With this, we have come to the end of this article analysis. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the final article discussion, which is about the controlled human infection model. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is provided here for your reference. This news article talks about a proposed control human infection model in India and the issues associated with it and also the prospects that are offered by this model. The news article says that the Department of Biotechnology is close to finalize three projects to develop a new influenza vaccine. Now, know that the Department of Biotechnology was set up in the year 1986. It functions under the Ministry of Science and Technology. It is responsible for the development and commercialization in the field of modern biology and biotechnology in India. So, based on this, the new projects will involve Indian and European scientists and it is estimated to cost around rupees 135 crores. The uniqueness of these projects is that they involve CHIM that is controlled human infection model. Before discussing about this CHIM, let us first know what is influenza. Influenza or flu is a contagious respiratory illness. It is caused by influenza virus. This virus affects and infects the nose, throat and sometimes even the lungs. This influenza virus belongs to the family of Orthomyxoviridae. So, the project proposed by Department of Biotechnology is based on developing new influenza vaccine. So, now let us discuss about the CHIM that is the controlled human infection model. This controlled human infection model is a study. In this study, a well characterized strain of an infectious agent or a pathogen such as viruses or bacteria is given to carefully selected healthy adult volunteers. Or in other words, we can say that it is a model in which humans are purposefully infected with an infectious agent in a controlled situation. The objective of this CHIM study is to better understand human diseases and to understand how they spread and also to find new ways to prevent these diseases and to treat them. These studies play a vital role in helping to develop vaccines for infectious diseases. It is said that these studies are already used in vaccine development in many countries. These countries are United States, United Kingdom, Kenya, etc. Now, it is considered to be used in India also. Let us first understand how a vaccine works. Traditionally, vaccines are made of a weakened disease causing virus or weakened disease causing bacteria. This virus or bacteria is injected into the body to persuade the immune system and the immune system will make antibodies. These antibodies creates immunity against the future infections. But there are some drawbacks associated with this method because frequently vaccines that work in small groups of people does not always work in larger populations. In some cases, vaccines that are effective in one country are not even effective in another country. So, this 
chim approach will speed up the process of analyzing whether potential vaccine will be effective in larger section of people or not and this chim study will also help to identify the factors that determine why some vaccinated people fall sick and others do not so this chim models helps the vaccine makers to decide whether they should go ahead with investing in the expensive trials or they should stop for example assume that clinical trials were done on people from somalia for a particular vaccine among the somalia population the vaccine showed 90% efficiency but this vaccine might not show the same efficiency when it is used in indian population so those who propose the chim model are saying that by using indians for clinical trials we can develop vaccines that are more efficient on indian people as we saw in the beginning the proposed projects by department of biotechnology will focus on making influenza vaccine and it is also said that india might also develop chim protocols to study bacterial or enteric viruses such as cholera or typhoid enteric viruses are those viruses which resides in the intestine so this means if these uh, chim protocols are developed and if the clinical trials are successful then the new vaccines will be a backup for the existing cholera and typhoid vaccines the news article also gives an example for a chim developed vaccine a hyderabad based biotech company has recently developed a typhoid vaccine with the help of chim approach this test was done in united kingdom with the use of typhoid parasite according to the news article the vaccine was tested among 1 lakh children in nepal bangladesh and malawi this vaccine was 80 percentage protective when it was tested on the field so like this the government can also produce vaccines and be successful with this chim model but some consider the use of chim model as against medical ethics because it involves intentionally infecting healthy people with an active virus and causing them to be sick so it also involves putting the human lives in danger which is against the medical ethics this is the view of some medical practitioners next the article also talks about a guidance document on chim according to the article experts in vaccine development then social scientists bioethicists and uh, department of biotechnology would prepare a guidance document on chim it would elaborate those circumstances under which chim trials may be conducted and it would also give the facilities that is needed for these trials and the profile of potential volunteers and the informed consent form that the volunteers have to sign and the compensation that can be offered to those volunteers will be given in these guidelines after this guidance document is prepared it should be approved by the drug control general of india to be used in india the drug control general of india functions under the central drug standard control organization that is cdsco the cdsco is under the ministry of health and family welfare and not under the ministry of science and technology so remember this the cdsco discharges the functions which is assigned to it by the central government under the drugs and cosmetics act of 1940 its important functions include regulating the import of drugs approval of new drugs approval of clinical trials etc that is why this chim study and the guidance document has to be approved by the drug control general of india who functions under cdsco with this we have come to the end of today's news article discussion sessions the split practice question will be discussed in the next session we have come to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session in this first question two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement the first statement states the 86th amendment to the constitution of india inserted an article to provide free and compulsory education of all children in the age group of 6 to 14 years as a fundamental right now the article which provides free and compulsory education of for all the children in the age group of 6 to 14 years is article 21a of indian constitution and yes this article was inserted by the 86th amendment act and also know that as per this article the parliament also enacted the right of children to free and compulsory education act that is the rte act of 2009 so this statement is correct now also know that there was one prelims question based on right to education act of 2009 in the year 2018 prelims examination and sometimes 
there are also questions in UPSC which are based on significant amendments made to the Indian constitution. Like this year that is in the 2019 prelims there was a question regarding 42nd constitutional amendment act and the 99th constitutional amendment act. So, you can always expect such questions. Now, let us see the second statement. It states that fundamental rights are mentioned in part 4 of Indian constitution. Now, this is wrong because fundamental rights are mentioned in part 3 of Indian constitution and it contains articles from 12 to 35. So, article 12 to article 35 constitute the fundamental rights. So, what is covered in part 4 of constitution? Part 4 consists of directive principles of state policy and it contains articles from 36 to 51. So, here the question asks for the correct statement. Here statement 1 is the correct statement. So, the final correct answer to this question is option A 1 only. Now, in this next question two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. The first statement states according to census 2011 more than 50 percent of Indian population speak Hindi. Now, this statement is wrong because during discussion also we saw that only 43.63 percentage of the population that is uh, around 52 crores of people speak Hindi. This means it is not more than 50 percent. So, this statement is wrong. Now, the second statement states the census 2011 considers Rajasthani and Haryanvi as the subset of Hindi. Now, this statement is correct because the census 2011 considers languages such as Bhojpuri, Gadwali, Chhattisgadi, Marwadi, Rajasthani, Haryanvi and many other languages under the subset of Hindi. So, this statement is correct. So, here the question asks for the correct statements. Here statement 2 is the correct statement. So, the final correct answer to this question is option B 2 only. Now, let us see this next question. It states recently archaeological survey of India has conducted excavation in Kiryadi. This site revealed historic remains belonging to the period of 3rd BCE to 3rd CE. Potsherds were also excavated from this site in which the names of individuals were inscribed in certain script. Which of the following script was inscribed in the potsherds? Now, in this four scripts are given Chinese, Indus, Tamil, Brahmi, Sumerian script. Now, in this question, if you know the answer, you can directly mark the answer or else you can use the method of elimination. Now, from this you can easily say that Chinese script belong to Chinese civilization and next the Sumerian script it belongs to the Mesopotamian civilization. So, both does not belong to India. So, you may be confused between Indus script and Tamil Brahmi script. So, if you remember our discussion you can easily answer this part because we saw that Kiradi is situated in Tamil Nadu. So, by a guess you can also mark Tamil Brahmi script which is the correct answer or else you can uh, go by the time period because the Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization is much older than the time period which is given in the question. So, you can mark the answer as C Tamil Brahmi script. Now, this question is based on Central Drugs Standard Control Organization that is CDSCO. First statement given is it functions under the Ministry of Science and Technology. When we see drugs standards etc. We think it comes under science and technology. So, you in a hurry you will mark this as a correct statement, but it is not so. CDSCO comes under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and it discharges functions assigned to the central government under Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. So, this means the first statement is wrong. Now, the second statement states it has the power to regulate the approval of new drugs and clinical trials. Now, this statement is correct. CDSCO has, has the power to regulate the import of drugs, approval of new drugs and approval of clinical trials etc. Here the question asks for the correct statements. So, the final correct answer to this question is option B 2 only. With this we have come to the end of today's Hindu news analysis. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation. <music>